Hi, this is Harold Cooper, and before we jump into this podcast interview, I just wanted to share that I've been lucky enough over the last couple of years to have interviewed a bunch of other leading therapists and agents of change, really exploring their take on everything rapid change related. What you're about to see it was recorded a little while ago, but it still holds tremendous value if you're someone that wants to learn about how to help people make quick behavioral shifts. So I hope you enjoy, and to make sure you don't miss any of the new releases, then take action and click that subscribe button, and then you'll be kept in the loop when any new episodes come out. Welcome to the Rapid Change Matters podcast. My name is Howard Cooper, and for over 14 years now, I've been fascinated with helping people to create personal change quickly. But I still come across many who believe that lasting personal change has to take a long time, consisting of reliving traumas or deep psychological analysis, or simply that flawed notion that understanding why you have a problem will somehow make it go away. I'm on a mission to get people who work therapeutically with others to shift their thinking and realize that these beliefs are not written in stone. Rapid change can happen. So, to help you open up to what's possible, I'm interviewing top therapists and agents of change who are out there getting real results with real people really quickly. Before we get to the interview, I just wanted to let you know that I've written a quick-to-read, downloadable PDF on five strategies to amplify your client's response with some great tips on getting your therapeutic suggestions to really sizzle. You can download this for free from rapidchange.works, where you can also find all the information about this episode and episodes still to come. Now, over to the interview. So today we are joined by Helen Bremner, who is not only an experienced hypnotherapist, but also an intensive care nurse. Helen is the creator of the only NHS primary care IBS hypnotherapy service, which boasts a 97% success rate of reduced symptoms and 100% patient satisfaction. So really looking forward to chatting with her today around the themes of rapid change and specifically how alternative therapies can work alongside the NHS and medical establishments. Welcome, Helen. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. So um, fascinated for uh, you to share with uh, the audience, the listeners at home, uh, a little bit more about yourself, what you do, how did you get started? Um, well, it's been, I think, back in 08, I finally did my training, having spent a long time in intensive care, thinking we do the life and death stuff really well, but the emotional stuff, the psychological stuff, absolutely abysmally. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought we needed to do both sides better. So I did a bit of training and found, actually, you know, we weren't allowed to use it as hypnosis. People were quite scared of it. So I used to have to do, I'm going to do some relaxation with that really stressed and scared patient over there. And um, so those things came to actually being able to help them properly. And then the job came up in IBS hypnotherapy, very strangely, four miles away from my house, the only one in the country. So I thought I'd be an idiot not to apply and got the job. And pretty much the rest is history. I've carried on with IBS as my specialty um, linking in with sort of anxiety and other problems with people and I find that a lot of the time people have got elements of IBS even if they don't have a diagnosis and their symptoms aren't that bad. Sure and uh, I'm going back a second you, you said that first of all when you started doing this and you uh, learned some of the tools of hypnosis you, you kind of weren't allowed to say you were doing hypnosis. Uh, oh, so how did they react to all of that and you know I know obviously you, you started saying as you mentioned that you'd call it relaxation but wh- why do you think they react in such a, a funny way around hypnosis and what that represents? I think it's the whole perception of mind control mm-hmm. and the more staged things people are aware of you know even Darren Brown's thing it, you know, the thing that was called mind control people believe they're out of control people think that's not appropriate particularly outside the remit of mental health you go into intensive care to have life or death treatment you don't go in there to have mind control done at you to you for you of you and the misconception I think stops people from opening up and going what actually is this you know, you've got the whole thing, the, the diagnosis of white coat hypertension, so a doctor can make somebody's blood pressure high just by being a doctor and near them. That's well recognised in the medical press. But actively trying to help someone with just the power of your word, I think they're not quite ready for that. So 
how do you think we get them ready or do you think we need to or should we just you know almost keep them separate and try and you know do our thing and let them do their thing i think it's very important to get that right my experience is sometimes when you've got the medical professionals doing doing the hypnotherapy or hypnosis as they a lot of people call it they get quite possessive of it and the reason people approach a hypnotherapist generally rather than the medical professional because they want a different approach they go to a doctor for a doctor a medical thing and they go to a therapist for a therapeutic thing and i find sometimes if we get ourselves confused between which is which you can approach somebody for therapy who is quite staid and unemotional and you know, which is my experience with some of the medics unfortunately that have been doing it it's an ownership it's a very now you will relax and that's not what I do. It's not what I think is a useful thing in a therapeutic sense. Mm -hmm. And yet you see, as I said, with stuff I've done with dental stuff, you read in the press and journals sometimes about people undergoing surgery with hypnosis. It hugely got clinical applications. And, yeah, I guess some, you'd probably happily be more comfortable with a doctor or a nurse who knows what they're talking about with surgery facilitating that patient. Mm -hmm. And somebody like me, I'm very particular so if someone starts talking about something, as a hypnotherapist trying to help me through something, and they're talking about something that's not factually correct, that will really distract me. Mm -hmm. Whereas a nurse going, well, actually, I know what's in theatre, so let's not talk about ethanol and strange smells that aren't actually going to be there. Let's perhaps not mention any smells at all, but what you would know about it. So I think, but those are details. Most people aren't quite as pedantic as I am. I think the other side, if you get it too, as my friend uh, Peter Walwell refers to himself as wacky, was talking about hypnosis being wacky. I thought, don't have to do it like that. It isn't about being completely bizarre or mind controlly or swinging a watch or all the rest of it. So I think there are separate, completely separate and completely together things that we need to do and work together. But the more we have people who are out there going, hypnotherapy is this, that, the other, and I can fix everything in two seconds flat without you doing any work, the more sort of charlatan type people we have out there the worse our reputation is going to be and the medical professions are not going to want to work with therapists who aren't medical. So that, I think that's a really interesting um, thing to talk about, um, this idea that there are a lot of people out there um, who are, I, I guess, promoting hypnosis and some of the alternative therapies out there that exist as a panacea for everything and essentially over-promising. Um, how would you handle... Uh, a client's expectations if they ring up for example where you know you want them to know or come with an open mind to experience what's possible but you also my guess is tread carefully because you don't want to over promise and there's kind of a, a a balance isn't there yeah absolutely i think when you're looking at something which is your perception your person as the power of the hypnotherapist is hypnosis already mm -hmm. you have people telling you oh, this is what i think is a useful thing well, great, then that's the power of hypnosis. If your role is important enough to, in the, the eye, mind of your client, then they're going to go with what you say. I had a client who came to see me once with talking about limiting beliefs, and I had to undo some work by a, another therapist because she went to him for weight control or weight loss and was told, be realistic, you're never going to get less than 11 stone. You'll lose weight, but you'll never get there. And there she was, beautifully, dutifully stuck exactly where this guy told her to be. So we had to do some work and she was just, just to release those perceptions because that wasn't her belief, it was his belief. Mm -hmm. And what I tend to do is involve the client's stated wishes, what they want, explore them and put them perhaps into a bit more neat, more specific language rather than making a judgment for me on what's possible for the client. Well, I have to say, in, in his defence, this, this other therapist sounds like a great hypnotist. He just didn't have the right suggestions. Yeah, the therapy part wasn't there. <laughs> yes. The hypnosis was definitely there by all accounts, yeah. Dutifully stuck at 11 stone. Are there solutions out there about the state of hypnosis being unregulated? I think the tricky part is, is once you've started regulation, and then if you found out it wasn't a good thing, you're stuck with it. Mm -hmm. You can't just suddenly deregulate. But as I said, there are people I've been have the experience of being around and working near or with that have gone, well, I'm guided by ascended beings, transcended beings, angels, this, that and the other. They didn't take any responsibility for what came out of their mouths. It was about, I'm, I'm just the portal for this thing far greater than myself, which to a limit would be OK. But when that um, transcended being tells the client that they should report their baby, I have a problem with that. 
Yes. And that's exactly what I heard from somebody sometime. Mm -hmm. And they were just guidance and, you know, effectively the voices said, abort your baby. Client went ahead and did that. Yeah. And I don't think any decision to have or not have a baby should be related to what a voice says in someone's head. It's a much more important. There's consequences for life for both having that child and not having that child, which I don't think the support was put in place for the client there. Mm -hmm. Helen, a couple of questions. One is, do you think I've always viewed therapy and the sort of work that we do as complementary? And I have a sneaking suspicion that many people within the medical world see us as alternative. Is that a fair comment? And is that something that, that you've seen or noticed? And, um, you know, do you think there's a responsibility that the medical establishment have to begin to look and incorporate some of the complementary approaches into their work? I absolutely agree that the complementary thing means we work together. And sometimes it isn't a an appropriate thing. If you talk about an anxiety situation, I was aware of a, a patient who was so anxious about blood tests, they required a full general anaesthetic every single time they required a blood test. They required a blood test you know, several times a year. And I found that completely inappropriate that the NHS would be funding, advocating, delivering a general anaesthetic, which is not without risks, when they could have had a very, <laughs> talking about change, quick um, hypnotherapy type intervention which would have yeah. prevented all of that and helped that person with their lives a lot better but if you're looking at alternatives if we are the strange out there very different people who don't work with the medical establishments we're establishing an us and them and they would think that hypnotherapy is full of idiots and charlatans and the idiots and charlatans fight back and say that they're they're all about you know, they're, in, they're in the pocket of big pharmaceutical companies which i hear a lot of as well Mm -hmm. And there's a great power in the word of these medical establishments, doctors particularly. It's not a good use of NHS funding if we start looking, exploring every possible treatment and efficacy. And it's up the people to, who want those treatments to be seen widely used to prove that thing works. We were lucky in the case of IBS because Warwell was a medical doctor. He got his professorship out of his work with irritable bowel syndrome. So he's a huge person to go. He's credible medically and now he's credibly, credible hypnotherapeutically. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at the drugs and other medical treatments undergo lots of trials and research to find out whether they work well and are cost effective. And I think we also need to justify why what we want to do with patients is the right thing to do for these patients who traditionally get the medical options. OK. I, I know we've obviously talked a little bit about the medical uh, establishments and how they view things do you find that there are some people certainly within things like ibs who struggle to see the connection between the mind and the body hugely i had somebody refer to to me who was a nurse who said absolutely insulted that the consultant gastroenterologist had referred her to me and said i've got something proper wrong with me something real and i will prove it so we were like oh and i had to apologize that she felt offended by the referral that she consented to bless her but I think in, in externally in Western medicine, often in media, a belief in the body and mind connection is received with suspicion and as if you're saying something completely bizarre and there could be no truth in it at all. But the clients who approach me and patients I've actually seen on the NHS rather than have been told by the GP that hypnosis won't work, don't bother going to see her, they're more open to the idea as they've already presented with the therapy, even if they've only turned up out of curiosity. And a lot then I find that's my job to ensure my explanations make sense to people in front of me. And generally, I've got a lot of things like talking about people in the armed forces. It is not a natural thing to go towards a war. It is not a natural thing for a fireman to go towards a fire. Police to get in front of this bit of an exciting thing. And we've all got that part of us where we want to do the fight. But your average person goes away from these problems rather than towards them. So with that... The idea that they, they can override their natural instinct to run away from something that's dangerous or, get in, or perhaps a bit exciting. You've got a reframe in there already about it being exciting rather than scary and dangerous. Look at what somebody on the battlefield can do to override the immense pain, the immense fear they're in if they're injured. If it saves their life, that is a form, I think, of hypnosis and the power of your body over your mind no one's denying that someone's had their limb blown off is in pain and yet they can keep quiet to get themselves to safety or to wait for someone to get them to safety so that they can live for another day
So essentially, <clears throat> one of the things that you would do is create lots of indeniable counter examples that, that, that give them an experience of going, hey, you know what? There's, I see that. I get that. That's, that makes sense. The thing mm -hmm. with um, free diving, fascinating, amazing. And I can't quite remember the top of my head now, but I think it's something like four minutes and 32 seconds on one breath someone could do a free dive for. And that's easily Googleable for your clients. If you go to a client and they say something and you've given them this little gem and they go, that person was talking utter rubbish, I don't trust them. And they look up what you've seen and they've found it. And they look into free diving and find it's real. And you know, my ability to hold my breath is nothing like four odd minutes. And yet right. these people are alive and healthy and well and a brilliant example of what's achievable. That is not just done by saying, I'm going to hold my breath now. There's a lot of work and emotional stuff that goes on to make that happen. Do you find yourself hearing other interactions with people from the medical profession and I don't know, I don't want to say the word cringing, but almost finding that you're hearing people who, from a hypnotherapeutic point of view, could be classed as giving people unhelpful suggestions? Well, such as the person with their 11 stone mm -hmm. thing, this will hurt, mm -hmm. this is expected to hurt, it's going to be painful. And that's all trying to get to people, you know, with the best will in the world to prepare them for something that is going to be unpleasant. But by doing that, you're telling them that the experience is going to be a negative one. And you know, as a mum myself, knowing the difference between my birth experience and someone else's, I, my baby got stuck. Other people, you know, literally their baby just does the thing that's meant to do. And they, some people don't even notice. Mm. And I think you can't say that I dealt worse with my experience versus someone who didn't have that experience. We both had a baby, but we both had a baby in a very different way. So it's thinking what that person's individual experience is. Don't tell them how it is for them. Ask them how it is for them and prepare them in a way that is realistic and yet supportive rather than, well, of course, it's going to hurt. Bring on the pain. Mm -hmm. Like when a little kid has fallen over in the playground, quite often the child doesn't cry until they see the blood gushing down their leg. And they go, well, this must hurt. I'm bleeding. Yeah. So c can you give me a couple of real examples of um, times or clients or people that you've seen where you've witnessed rapid change? You know, they come in one way and they leave with a different mindset, a different a, a personal transformation has occurred. I think there's a huge amount of you know, everything you've ever seen. You've done some kind of change with somebody is just how dramatic that's been and quite how I guess as the subject is rapid, mm -hmm. how rapid that's been. I had one lady and my, my hypnotherapy in the NHS has been about explaining to them about IBS itself. And at the last 20 minutes or so of the appointment, just going, I'm going to give you a sample trance here. This is what I've been talking about. This is why you're here. Other than the lady who thought she'd come for hydrotherapy. But that was another issue. <laughs> Didn't want hypnotherapy after all, it turned out. So, and I just gone, here's an experience. I'm going to put you in induction, relax you, which is what my stressed IBS patients wanted. Mm -hmm. um, put an anchor in, bring you back. And I think I had about four of the people who came to see me say, thanks, I'm done now. Amazing. I don't have IBS. And there were no suggestions about them not having IBS. But obviously the power of IBS hypnotherapy will help you because it's helped all these others. Those are the research papers. We want to look them up. That was the most rapid I had. And another lady who's been very anxious, very unwell, very stressed and quite a, I mean, a victim is not quite the word I want to use, but quite a vulnerable person who looked after everybody else in the world. Um, and also the fear of flying who went out on her holiday, on her after her second appointment, and that second appointment was about her fear of flying, nothing to do with the bowels. And then she came back and showed me pictures of her in a microlight. Amazing. That's like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty quick and 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 long lasting. I think the bit I have with um, the rapid change is it needs to be sustained. A lot of people, you know, we can achieve something in the moment, but things like irritable bowel, you want something that's going to last for a long time, not just when you're in the client or the therapist's room. So you want things to be going long, give them tools to help themselves. I, I'm wondering whether there are people out there who might be listening to this thinking, well, hang on a second. I, I, I hear what Helen is saying uh, about IBS and mind body and all of this stuff, but really, really? And I, I actually just wanted to take a moment to uh, really get you, Helen, to explain that you've got the, the scientific studies, the papers to back it up with and that people can go and check this stuff out. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Peter Walwell's, I think his first paper was in 1984 in The Lancet, 
which isn't any old Daily Mail rag. It's of some very credible medical journal. And his work and has been followed up. I think there was a five or a ten year follow up paper. And again, very you know, statistically significant maintenance of the improvements they made in therapy. That all of those, I think there's something like 500, I think it was five years, I think it was 500 patients at that level, all of them sustained pretty much what they got from therapy in the first place. So it is long term, it is sustainable. I've written two papers on what I've done with my work, which being individualised rather than research, did come out with better results because it was about the person in front of me, not about proving that a therapy would work. And yes, absolutely, it is provable. And I know, unfortunately, due to confidentiality thing, I couldn't get those papers back up or each individual patients. But everyone I saw had a beginning, a middle and an end questionnaire for their well-being, mentally, their physical symptoms, their irritable bowel quality of life. And as many things as I could find to trip myself up and prove I didn't work actually served to help me in the end and proved it all did work. On a, a slightly different note, how would you define rapport? And uh, often I hear therapists talking about, you know, you have to have rapport in order to help people change. Is that something you agree with? And, and you know, what role does it play for you? Well, for me, because I'm looking at it therapeutically, I find it rapport is essential to make that connection with the client, seeming to understand them so well that you're almost reading their mind. And people who say that, how did you know I was going to say that next? And you give the wry smile and the reassurance there. But that's what it's about. Seeming like you're their old trusted friend almost in an instant. Too yeah. quick, it's a bit creepy. So you don't want to become running in and saying, I am reading your mind because clearly you're not. But it's that understanding of understanding people, understanding motivation. And I find it very important to understand that because people are trusting you. They've still got a lot of people still got the perception that you're going into their mind and controlling them. So effectively giving you the key to their mind and saying you go in there and you tramp around Mr. Stranger or Mrs. Stranger. I think people are very good to trust you. It helps that I was a nurse. It helped that my service was on the NHS. But that's still something when you're going to see somebody privately who isn't a nurse and isn't an NHS nurse. You've got to trust them. And if you go into somebody's room, you don't get that rapport. As I said, it becomes creepy. This is where all the stories come from. In the, you know, again, in the sort of the gutter press that talk about I was forced to do this. This awful person hypnotised me against my will and all those things. If you've got the rapport, and for me, I make sure I don't touch people because that particular NHS, I didn't want any situation ever to be she touched me and it was inappropriate because that would completely ruin everything for everybody else. Mm. So if I never touch them, except if they shake my hand at the end of appointment, everybody can say, I never touched you. And there's no question about anything inappropriate happening, which then allows, if they want to, to come back and no one's going to make any questions about something dodgy happening to them. Yeah, which I think is a, a very important thing for people to bear in mind, especially if people are working um, in an environment where it's just you, just someone else. And the, the therapist is very vulnerable to accusations, but furthermore, when you're looking at people with difficulties particularly around IBS or anxiety or self-esteem confidence mm. they are very vulnerable as well so what would you see as the important aspects to creating change that lasts working out what the client wants mm -hmm. if they come in and they say I want to stop smoking and two seconds later they're talking about their relationship with their sister father whoever I make sure that that's what they want to talk about and it's you know, not coming here to chat as a friend, you're coming here to do some therapeutic work. So do you want to work on that smoking? Do you want to work on the family relationship? And if it's that's what they want, then we work out how to make it happen. I put various suggestions in that the unconscious mind will work things out the way they want, in the way it needs to be done. And sometimes it's not all to do it in one huge step. And then we've spoken about people who have had a, you know, almost a miraculous conversion from having a problem to not having a problem. Some people need that done stepwise. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fit with their remit. Sometimes I find the people who said, oh, I they did everything that you asked them to do in the trance state. They're doing things that you said, you know, just exhibiting the signs of being in, in a trance. All these wonderful features and phenomena. You don't want to tell them what they are because then they'll start looking for them. And then they come and you've done some work and they're relaxed and they're calm and all the rest of it. And then they go, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't hypnotised. Nothing happened. Like, don't talk yourself out of it. But what I say to them is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happened because we're talking to your unconscious mind. So that and being to not worrying about where you're going, 
focus on what matters to you, which is what you've come here to fix, not what you know, the experience itself is. The hypnosis is a way of doing it. It's yeah. not what you're here for. Oh, and one thing I like to stress <clears throat> with people who uh, are listening is um, my own take on rapid change is rapid is defined for me as as quick as it can be done. Uh, that doesn't mean quicker than it can be done, whether that's six months or six minutes. That probably won't be six years like some other therapies we've experienced. Well, certainly, you know, when uh, if people are, are, are hearing that, you know, someone comes in uh, and suddenly one session later, IBS goes or suddenly uh, fear of flying is sorted. The idea that, you know, a first choice would be to go and see someone who goes, well, I'm going to see you once a week for a year. You know, we have to begin to, to question that, perhaps. I think that needs to come from the client about what, what's comfortable for them and what they would expect. And so you find a lot of advertising for hypnotherapists going, I can do this. You know, Paul McKenna's made a lot of money about the series he's done and I can make you, I can fix this, I can sort that. And I think if we go, I can do this in one session, the client is potentially set up for a fail because they have then failed on the way back and go, well, I need more help than one session. Whereas if you can go, it takes as many sessions as it wants, but let's do this in as quickly as we can for you, as you know, it takes as long as it takes for you. And if you need it done quickly, really quickly, it will work for you that way. Yep. Put the right things in there for you. Whereas if I'm going, well, it suits me to make them, you know, brevity really isn't everything for everybody, I think. Hmm. You need to deal with the issues in order for something else coming up again later. Then I know how to deal with this sort of thing because I've got the tools now. It's giving them a toolkit rather than fixing a specific issue. Because okay. then you'll only have that one thing problem that's resolved rather than that sort of a problem. And talking about issues, how far do you think it's important to explore the past in terms of building a positive future? I am fervently against the um, the ISE idea of the initiating sensitizing event, I think they call it, mm-hmm. because then this is the reason, this is the reason why you are like this, and let's go back and relive and regurgitate. I don't think that gives you the reason. Like a lot of the time, I don't think there is one singular reason, but I think if clients want to find a reason, and this is the way they want to do it, I'll help them talk about that past and explore that past to make sense of something to help them to move on. But I don't think we need to go into the what's and why's and wherefores because your memories are as you plant them at that time. And most of us don't have a memory system that is filed chronologically, unbiased, from an unbiased perception. It's all about, and memories tend to be filed whether we're really extremely sad or extremely happy or extremely angry, and they've got those filters on. And I don't think that revisiting extreme pain, extreme sadness, extreme anger is therapeutic and helpful. Well, are we talking specifically about things like timeline where we're getting people to go back um, and find, you know, the first moment of some uh, unresolved memory that this is all connected to? Is that the, is that the sort of thing that we're, we're talking about here? I think it's more when the, the people talk about the affect bridge and actually going back mm. and reliving that experience. I think timeline does have its place where you can re, revisit a memory. If you don't make it a fact because you're changing it, so you can't make it a fact if you're changing what your memory is of that, of that event happening. Mm-hmm. So that's almost like a reframe, but doing it on a timeline rather than saying feel, feel differently about this because otherwise people will carry on and carry this burden of sadness with around them forever. But I think going back and reliving and the past life thing and this past life, there must be this reason that you're like this in this life. I know some people have a, a great belief in it and it's not for me to knock what I don't know or understand, but it's not something that works for me. And I've never had a client ask me for that, thankfully. Different note, whose work, whose methodology has had a, a, the biggest impact on you and the way in which you work? So coming from something medical that needs a scientific base and justification and rationale. And a lot of the time, I think the job of a nurse is to translate intelligent, high scientific doctor speak into something that your average human person can understand. And reading something by Michael Yapko, I thought, this is accessible. This is something I know nothing about. And yet I feel this is a friend talking to me about something I know lots about. I just don't know these specifics. And everything I've read by him has that same excitement, that same, you know, you're as good as I am. I'm just sharing my knowledge. Have this, my friend. And I love his work for that very reason. Mm-hmm. And full of useful information, full of useful things that you can, you, know, you can photocopy one page and use loads of things from that if you were going to do something like that. It's always useful, always helpful and always accessible. 
So are there any specific books that jump out in your mind? Uh, well, Trance Work's the biggest piece that he did. And as I said, it's, there's so many different applications in it. So much expl- explains how and what and who and against some other ideas. And so it's, it's fantastic. I'm really, really pleased I got that book. How far does the change worker's attitude affect the results or expectation of what you're able to help them with? Well, I think that generally your limiting beliefs can endanger anyone's ability to affect your positive change. So if you're going to somebody and says, I can do everything for you, and then it's, well, they're doing that, that makes you a failure as a client. And I find that a lot with vulnerable people going for therapy. They don't ever blame the person they've gone to, they blame themselves. And you know, back in the film with um, Sixth Sense with Haley Joel Osment saying, saying people only see what they want to see. Mm-hmm. And if you've got somebody who's stuck behind fear and sadness and limiting beliefs, they're going to believe they can't be helped by anybody. The more therapists they go to see, the more failure they experience, the worse human being they are. And if it doesn't work for them, it's not because the therapist was rubbish or not right for them or the therapy itself wasn't right for them. They are a bad human being. So I think that responsibility in the therapist is huge to get it right for that person. And yeah, admittedly, it's not happened to me yet. But if it's the wrong person for the wrong client, find that client the right person and have the balls to stop and refer them on rather than create a further mess. I think I think there's a professional and ethical responsibility to work in that way with people. And that if the fit isn't right, then f- better put your hands up and go, do you know what? It's not right. Let, let me help you find someone that is. Absolutely. And you see that in some people's websites. I can help with everything you've ever heard of. Well, how can you specialise? You know, if you look at the medical model, you wouldn't go to a paediatrician for an old age person problem. You go for someone who specialises in the thing or the area that you have your problem in. And I think the more of us who, yes, it does limit what you do, but it doesn't because I've seen so many people with irritable bowel who also have a dental phobia, also have a flying phobia, also have anxiety issues, also have social issues and health fears, that it is actually a huge remit rather than a very limited one. But if we say we can do everything for everybody, we'll be letting ourselves down and also misrepresenting ourselves. What would you suggest to people in terms of getting good at this stuff, practising, refining skills? Again, looking at who you're working with. There's a certain thing that a lot of people sort of work with their, their, their colleagues and practice a few things. That's more about techniques. It's not necessarily about the therapy. If you're working with somebody who's vulnerable, your mistakes can really cause a problem later on or cause a problem to them. So it's about working out you know, what the right approach is. Everything in two dimensions, lots of training, will only help you in two dimensions unless you're working with somebody. So I guess it's treading very carefully and knowing your limits, but working up with those limits and thinking, if I'm not comfortable with this, how would I get better? Who do I need to go and talk to? Who do I need to help with? Can I have some direct supervision or indirect supervision, some you know, supervision mentorship type thing that would get me the skills that I need to be able to help people more effectively? So um, if people are listening to the podcast and uh, are keen to hear more from you, uh, read more about the work you do and uh, they want to get in touch, how should they do that? Where can they go? Um, I turn up quite well on Google, and it is actually me, not some other person called me. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, you can email me at helen.bremner at hotmail.com, or I'm on Facebook as Helen Bremner, and I think there's an IBS hypnotherapist. I'm sort of on Twitter, but I'm not really a Twitter fan, so you won't get much on there. And there's a, my IBS hypnotherapy course.web.com. Okay. Well, again, all of those links we will put on the uh, the Rapid Change uh, Works website, uh, and they'll be on the episode uh, guide information on the uh, iTunes uh, store as well. Um, is there anything else that we haven't talked around um, about Rapid Change that actually would be important, you think, to be able to, to tell people or explain or explore? I guess the one thing was talking about you know, an effective change. A lot of people I've met as clients have a bit of a natural negative disposition and that disposition can filter their perception of even good things and they can find, back to Haley Joel Osment and they only see what they want to see, they continue to prove as far as they're concerned that they need to suffer and they need to have bad luck. And um, I find with my people with IBS, we'll get things done very soon in early in stages, early appointments, but then life would happen and these people did experience quite bad lives. They had either dysfunctional relationships or were bullied at work, something beyond their control. 
but that would then later bring their symptoms back. So we'd have a nice little reprieve and then something would happen in life that then started off their, uh, their symptoms again. So it's about, as I said, not to do this necessarily quick fix. It fixed quickly, but the permanent fix isn't there. So it's about working with people and don't expect everything to be wonderful. And as a therapist, don't be afraid to call those people you've helped and see if they're still OK. Because if they are, that's a very good recommendation and get a testimonial from them. And if they're not, help them a bit more. Uh, on behalf of uh, myself and the listeners, I really wanted to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, and uh, again, all the links will be put on the website uh, as well. It's been fascinating and uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, why not share it with anyone you think might be interested and even head over to iTunes to give us a glowing review. You'll find more about what's coming up on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash rapid change works. And of course, you'll find all the links related to this episode, plus those free five steps to getting your suggestions to sizzle over at rapidchange.works. <laughs>